Starship launch pad repairs and upgrades are almost complete. And now those repairs and upgrades are starting to be tested ahead of the second flight of the world's most powerful rocket. What's up, Star fans? I'm Jack Byer with NSF, and I'm gonna take you through everything that's happened in the last week in Starbase. So let's get started. Sponsored by Private Internet Access. Last week, we covered Booster 10's move over to the Massey test site. This week, crews have been hard at work, hooking it up to the recently installed ground umbilicals ahead of its cryo-proof test campaign. That's where they fill the vehicle with cryogenic liquid nitrogen to pressure test its integrity at temperatures similar to LOX and liquid methane. If all goes well, Booster 10 could be the one to support the third flight of the Starship program. Similar to Booster 10, the work ongoing at Starbase isn't always about the next flight in the line. Sometimes it's about the flight after the next one, or the flight after that, 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 or the flight after that. You get it, you get the idea. It's many flights down the line is what they're doing to work for at times. And that is what the Star Factory expansion is all about. Here, you can see that more work has been done this week, adding more roof structure to the building. One day, hopefully sooner rather than later, dozens of Starship vehicles could be born inside this structure. Next up, this week we also saw the return of the Starlink loader box to the payload integration building. For real though, it sounds like they're powering up a giant robot over there, which I guess, Starship. The box gets loaded with Starlinks inside, and then it is used to insert the satellites into Starship's payload bay. At least in theory, anyway. This box was just tested once on Ship 24 last year, and since then it hasn't been used for anything that we've seen. Though who knows really what they've been doing with it while it's out of sight. I wonder, what's the ship that's going to be the first to carry Starlinks? Let us know what you think in the comments. It could perhaps be either Ship 28 or Ship 29, as they do still have payload bay doors. Both vehicles still reside in the high bay at this moment, but at the ever-changing Starbase, this may not be the case soon. Fun fact, you can differentiate between Ship 28 and 29 because Ship 28 has recently gotten tiles over its weld lines, where Ship 29 still has naked welds. So you can use that next time you're watching Starbase Live to determine which vehicle is which. Next to Ship 28 and 29 in the high bay, at least for a chunk of the week, was a weird neighbor that's appeared in recent weeks. According to its label, it says it is Ship 24.2, and it's mainly a ship payload bay section that has, well, some weird stuff on top. That weird stuff is a single ring with a flat elliptical dome, and as you can see, it has a bunch of pipes sticking out of it and a lot of reinforcements. But no, we don't think this ring is going to be used as hot staging hardware. Why? Well, we've seen this kind of reinforced ring before though not exactly like this. Normally, they're part of a test article, and it is believed that this ring will provide the support needed for a stress test of the payload bay section. Once it's completed, it will likely be rolled out to Massey's, where work has been underway for a while to modify the lower half of the nose cone structural stand, aka the nose cone jail, to support testing of the payload bay sections. This structural testing will be crucial for SpaceX to determine the strength of the payload bay and the PEZ dispenser on board. If all goes well, SpaceX should sign off on this design, which will open the door. Get it? Like, open the payload door? To, to, to Starship's carrying Starlink, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Uh, before we continue, a word from our sponsor. I'm gonna tell you the password I use for everything. It's Shortback Bacon 1988 Wait, why would anyone give out such personal information? That's exactly what I think when I see people browsing the internet unencrypted. Basically, anyone can get at your data. That's why I use Private Internet Access. It's a VPN. I know, shocker, acronym in a space video, but bear with me. A virtual private network hides your IP address and safeguards your internet connection acting as a digital shield against non-bacon lovers. Or, you know, just people trying to steal your private information or collect all your information and market it to ad services. You can access servers in all 50 states and 84 countries. And best of all, it works across all platforms, including Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. Click the link in the description or go to piavpn.com NSF to get 83% off private internet access. That's just $2.03 a month, come on. All right, I'll send it back to you while I go change all my passwords. Over at the Mega Bay, work continues preparing Booster 9 for its upcoming static fire test campaign. And of course, the second integrated flight test of Starship. How long until we see static fires with Booster 9 remains to be seen, but it could be before the end of the month, pending, of course, deluge plate installation and testing. 
Over the last weeks, a mysterious tank has been installed over the location of one of Booster 9's smaller chines. We have no clue what this will be for, but we'll keep our eyes on it and see what we can learn. Next to the Mega Bay, construction on the second Mega Bay continues, and it's now well through its fourth level. As of recording, three of the four corners of level four are now installed on the building, and a construction elevator has begun to be installed. I really can't wait until level five happens. Did, do we have any King Crimson fans out there? The power to believe? No? All right, all right I'll, I'll go. Prefabrication of these Mega Bay sections continues at the Sanchez site near the entrance to Starbase. It's normal to see two or three of these sections being built at the same time here, but these are going to be among the last ones needed. If the new Mega Bay is the same size as the old one, then all that is left is one more level and the top floor. Near here, progress continues relocating the ground fabrication building, which was previously located further down the road near the production tents. Since that location is being taken over by the Star Factory expansion, it had to be moved over here. A lot of old hardware still remains around the site. In fact, just the other day, I saw Booster 8's aft section getting moved and scrapping of it finally begin. It's sad when vehicles are scrapped, but it's even sadder when you think you've spotted a new booster aft section and you run over and take a bunch of photos of it and get all excited and then you notice the spot where the HPUs used to be. Next to the Sanchez site is the Rocket Garden, where SpaceX has disconnected LR-11,000 cranes from Ship 26 and reconnected it to Ship 27. Why have we hooked up a crane to Ship 27 and released it from Ship 26? No idea. Normally the crane is used to hold the structure of the ship in place while its tanks are unpressurized. This allows crews to work on the interior of its tanks without compromising its structural integrity. Perhaps that's just what they're going to do with Ship 27. As always, we'll keep an eye on it. Over here at the launch site, a very similar thing is happening with Ship 25. The giant LR-11000 crane here was moved over to Ship 25 and attached to its tip this week. Since then, work has been ongoing inside its tanks, although we don't know exactly what kind of work it is. We can imagine that SpaceX is likely readying the ship for its upcoming flight and slowly incorporating all of the lessons learned from the first full stack flight, which happened almost three months ago. Man, time flies. However, just before this crane was hooked to Ship 25, it was used for a much more important task, installing the remaining manifolds that will blast water into the pipes underneath the orbital launch mount. There's a pipe in the shape of a Y letter that connects on one side to one of the two pipes coming from the water tanks, and on the other side, it connects to two of the manifolds. Another single pipe connects the second water pipe to the third manifold under the OLM. Three more plates will need to be added to the central plate to complete the deluge system. It's likely that non-cooled steel plates may still be installed on the outer rim outside the immediate Raptor blast zone, as indicated by Elon a while ago, but we'll have to wait and see if they get to that. This week, work has also been ongoing on the cryogenic pipes that were installed last week. There's been lots of grinding, lots of welding, and loads of work on the orbital launch mount. On some of these shots, you can see how these plates are currently elevated relative to the current ground level and the cryo pipes are still not covered. You can see in this time lapse how even during the night, work is ongoing. The concrete pump almost looks like some kind of giant demented robot mosquito taking little sips near the OLM. These workers definitely deserve some praise for putting in all of this incessant work practically 24 seven. At the launch tower, crews are also modifying the shielding that protects the draw works, hopefully so it doesn't look like Gruyere cheese after the next flight. Alex wrote, Alex wrote Gruyere cheese. Alex, it's Swiss cheese. Is this a cultural difference we just discovered? It looks like Swiss cheese. Hopefully it doesn't after the next flight. All right, moving on. Speaking of the drawworks, they've only been used a few times since Starship's first integrated flight test. Recently, the drawworks were used to lower the chopsticks that had been raised to leave room for all the cranes around the orbital launch mount area. Next up, perhaps the most important thing of the week happened actually when no workers were around. It's a weird feeling being out here at Starbase and suddenly realizing no one is on the orbital launch mount and things have gone quiet especially while there's no closures. That's when you know something must be cooking. And no, it was not me, despite the heat out here. This rare event happened twice this week and was followed by testing of some of the orbital launch site upgrades. The first one was from the ground water tanks. It appeared to be some kind of purge test, judging by all the dirt it stirred up and made fly away. I rushed down to the pad shortly after the test, kind of hoping to see if something else like that happened again. The venting or purge or whatever they were doing seemed to still be ongoing when I arrived, and it could still be heard for a long while. Then the venting stopped, workers returned to the orbital launch mount, and I had to leave because it was sunset and I need food. Hey, 
rocket launch photographers need food too, right? The second testing round was much more weird because not only did workers clear the pad, but also, according to security, there was a blast danger area around the site. We all waited and waited, and all that happened was a big puff of venting and dirt from the LOX side of the orbital tank farm, but nothing more. There wasn't one, there wasn't two, there wasn't three, but seven tests of the RBQD, the Raptor Boost Quick Disconnects, that helped start up the outer 20 engines on a super heavy booster. These tests seem to be a combination of purges at different pressures, but definitely quite a loud series of tests like no other previously seen on this system. Which is really cool to see, even if only on Starbase Live and our daily videos, and I guess this video. Either way, it's super exciting and another sign that we're getting ever closer to Orbital Flight Test 2 or Integrated Flight Test 2, whatever you want to call it, Electric Boogaloo. The next major test we're all waiting to see is, of course, a test of the water-cooled steel plates. Now when you watch Starbase Live and you see the pad empty, maybe there's one of these tests about to happen. If the plates work, perhaps next time Starship launches, there won't be any concrete flying away. We're also keeping a close eye out for rollout of Booster 9, although it would probably get its hot staging extension first. Though, I don't know, what do you think? Let us know in the comments. Will it get its hot staging first and then roll out, or will it roll out and then get its hot staging attachment? If you have no idea what I'm talking about, we're all expecting a little adapter to go in between the ship and the booster to help facilitate hot staging. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. And don't forget, click the link in the description and get 83% off private internet access. Okie doke, we'll see you next week, and as always, be excellent to each other.